Welcome back to Ring of Fire. I'm Mike Papantonio. In 2003, the drug industry found a way to increase their bottom line by hundreds of millions of dollars by aggressively targeting women. As a result, we've seen a flood of products that hit the market that are causing pain, suffering, and sometimes death for women all over America. I have attorney Robert Price with me now to talk about one of the newest products on the market that's harming women. Tell us the story. Uh, Pap, uh, about two weeks ago in New Jersey, a jury found that a transvaginal mesh product called the ProLift Kit, a prolapse uh, kit, it's a piece of mesh, a large piece of mesh implanted in, in a woman named Linda Gross. Uh, the jury awarded her $3.35 million in compensatory damages and uh, awarded a punitive damages award of $7 million against Ethicon, which is a subsidiary of Johnson & Johnson for putting out a defective product. Okay, well tell, tell us what is this product and how do women, uh, how do, how do women go about buying it and what, what should they know? Uh, this product is what's called a pelvic organ prolapse kit. It's a piece of mesh, it's a large piece of mesh about the size of your palm that has been passed out to doctors around the country by large medical device manufacturers. And actually these products are being taken off the market currently. Uh, basically for the past, since 2004, these products have been on the market being placed in the hands of OBGYNs, uh, urogynecological clinics being put in women to correct stress urinary incontinence and pelvic organ prolapse. These are conditions that are usually caused by childbirth. The Tell us how bad the damages are. Give us some examples of just exactly how bad these damages are and why women need to know about this. What women need to know what essentially happened is the same mesh that was used in hernia mesh, polypropylene mesh, began to be used in these pelvic surgeries and then manufacturers began to mass produce devices and what happens when polypropylene mesh goes inside a woman's pelvic region is that the mesh actually bonds with tissue and it begins to shrink and contract and degrade and harden and it actually forms up a foreign body response and essentially what happens is the mesh eats away at a woman's pelvic tissue. It, it, it hardens, it erodes, and it degrades a woman's pelvic region. And, and, and what organs are affected by this? And what can a surgeon even do once it starts taking place? Uh, the organs that are affected are the vaginal epithelium. It's actually the inside of a woman. And it's the surrounding organs, such as the bladder, the bladder neck, the urethra, the rectum, the colon, all of these, these, these major pelvic organs are being affected and they're essentially being eaten away by this mesh. And what happens is once this mesh comes in, it, it never really can come out. The best a surgeon can do to correct the problem is to, is to, to cut away at it, to remove it in pieces. And that is a long, years long, painful process where a surgeon has to go in and remove this stuff over and over. And once- So there's, there's, ner there's nerve damage, tissue damage, Damage, organ damage, muscle damage, and I think the woman that was just uh, the case that was just tried, she had 400 procedures to try to fix the problem. She was on 20 pills a day just to stop the pain and the infections that flowed from that. Did I, is that correct? That, that's accurate. She went to a doctor over 400 times because of this product to get, like you said, medications, clippings, removal surgeries, just years and years of pain. Okay, so the reason this product was sold, it w wasn't necessary because you had trained surgeons who could perform the procedure without mesh and in fact had been performing the procedure without mesh for, for decades. And then all of a sudden, this company comes on the market. They, John, uh, Johnson & Johnson says, hey, we can make some quick money here by putting together a kit that every doctor can use. And that was a lie because every doctor could not use it adequately, could they? That's correct. Essentially, the problems of pelvic organ prolapse and stress urine incontinence have been around uh, since the beginning of time. And what happened is these manufacturers, they saw an opportunity to make money. They saw an opportunity to make money and to put out a device that didn't need to be tested because of the FDA's uh, kind of rubber stamp, what's called the 510K process. Well, wait wait a second. Did the FDA ever approve this, this product? Did the FDA ever, ever say to this company, you can sell this product? The FDA 
clears products like this, but the interesting thing about this product and about Ethicon, which is essentially Johnson & Johnson's behavior, is that they didn't even go to the FDA with this product. They saw another product on the market. The first product that came out was in 2004 by a competitor, American Medical Systems, and before even going to the FDA, Johnson & Johnson just decided to put this thing out on the market and then go get clearance three years later. I mean, and the FDA, came, if I got this right, Robert, the FDA came back in and said you have to uh, you have to do some testing, and you have to prove that it's safe. And rather than doing that, if my understanding is correct, rather than doing what they were supposed to do in the first place, they simply decided to pull the market from the from the pull the product from the market. And now thousands and thousands of women have this product inside them. Is that correct? That's correct. That's correct. Last year, the FDA came out and said, "Look at all this data. Look at look at all this stuff that's happening to women. Uh, maybe we should have required you guys, the manufacturers, to test this stuff." And then, instead of the manufacturers following through and finding what the true data would be, they're now pulling these products off the market. They've made their money on the victims that are now here, and, and, and they now and, and, and women and women are stuck with it. Robert right. Price, no surprise here. Just another ugly story coming out of the drug industry. Right. Thank you for joining me. Thanks, Pop. Robert Price is an attorney and consumer advocate. The targeting of women by the drug industry that we just discussed wasn't limited to medical devices. In fact, one of the biggest cash sources for the industry is birth control. And they figured out that if they deceive consumers about their products, they'd be more likely to switch to new, more expensive means of birth control. Joining me now to talk about the dangers of some very popular means of birth control is Seth Katz. Seth, it sounds like it's another drug company looking at another product that kills another woman in the United States. What is going on? It, why, why, what is this with marketing drugs that seem to target women? This Yaz case is a case, the story just won't go away. You know, Mike, this was a drug that really wasn't needed in the marketplace. It was a birth control pill, or it is a birth control pill, amongst many birth control pills that are safe and effective for women that have been around for years. This was an example of a drug company seeing that there was another drug company with an antidepressant making some money and saying, hey, we can fill that niche through a birth control pill and expand the number of women using the birth control pill. And what so, they, hey, Seth, when they came out with this, how many, I mean, how many birth control options were out there that women could have used that did not kill them? Scores of them. Scores of them, Pap, that had been around with proven forms of estrogen and progestin that had been safe and effective. But the problem with those, Mike, is they were available in generic. So the big brand companies weren't making any money on them. Okay, so how did this Yaz product, it, this is Bayer Corporation, is that correct? This is Bayer. How, how did they go about taking this product and ex basically expanding the market to people who really, A, didn't need it, and B, were being lied to as far as what the product would actually do from an efficacy standpoint? What they did was they combined a birth control pill with the approval for something called PMDD. 80% of the people that were polled on what that term meant and what that disease was, which stands for premenstrual dysphoric disorder, didn't know what it was. Now, 80% of women who menstruate know what PMS is. And what uh, Bayer did was they marketed this product to treat PMS instead of the approved indication of PMDD. And okay, fact, let me be clear. They had not, the FDA had not given them any clearance at all to market this drug for women who were suffering from PMS, which is 80% of the public, but 80% of women, but they did give them permission to market it to for people with PMDD, which is 3%. So Bayer calculated they couldn't make enough money on the 3%, so they did what they call off-label and expanded the right to be able to use it for everybody, made it almost u ubiquitous, told all these women it was going to cure their, cure their PMS, which was a lie. Is, did I get that right? That is correct. They did the math that you just did and realized that 80% was a much bigger swimming pool than 3% of the women who actually suffer from PMDD. And what they did was they spent hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars promoting this product in an off-label manner. So, so much so that the FDA came down on them after several years and finally said, you need to run a $20 million corrective ad campaign. And when Bayer finally did that, they thought it was funny and created a 
hoax video to show how sincere they were in trying to deceive the public. The idea was to take the spoof video where they basically were making fun of women. At the time they made the spoof video, hundreds of women had died from, uh, from stroke. Uh, embolisms, all different heart heart attacks, all different kinds of problems. When, hundreds of women that women had died, but they never really took that seriously, did they? To this day, they still don't take that seriously, do they? They never took it seriously, Mike. Thousands of women had suffered from these blood clots, whether it was a pulmonary embolism, which is a blood clot in your lung, or a deep vein thrombosis, which has long-term, long-lasting effects of, uh, of your circulatory system, or women who've had blood clots in their brain and strokes. I mean, these, these products, Yaz and Yasmin, and their generic version, which was also manufactured by Bayer, known as Ocella and Gianvi, have injured thousands of thousands of American women who should have never been on this product. And the, and the product is still on the market. The FDA had another chance to do the right thing. This is under the Obama administration. This, is, this isn't the Bush FDA. This is the Obama FDA. The Obama FDA had the right to do the right thing, which was to pull the product off the market. And instead, what did they allow the company to do? In December of 2011, the FDA uh, convened an advisory committee. And what that is is a group of what are supposed to be independent doctors to come in and evaluate the product for the FDA and give the FDA a recommendation. Well, in this case, the advisory committee consisted of at least four to six people that we know of who had financial ties to Bayer. And in a very narrow vote of 15 to 11, the advisory committee had, uh, recommended to keep the product on the market, but in a 21 to 4 vote, they voted to change the label. Now, that label change did occur in April of 2012, but by then it was too little, too late, and really the, the uh, label change was weak at best. So this is another situation. Industry makes a new product. They lie to the American public about the safety of the product. The FDA says, yeah, it's okay to lie. And it's business as usual as Bayer continues to sell this product, change the label slightly, but nothing's really different. Seth Katz, as usual, uh, thank you for following this story. It is a story that affects all American women. Uh, I, I would talk to your doctor about, yes, yeah, get the truth. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks, Mike. Seth Katz is an attorney with the Berg Simpson Law Firm. That's it for this week's Ring of Fire, but you can keep up with us throughout the week online at ringoffireradio.com, on Twitter at Ring of Fire Radio, and on Facebook. I'm Mike Papantonio, and we'll see you next week right here on Ring of Fire.